Oh, it is. Okay, Here you go. Uh, the thing is, do we do we start from the from the beginning because we were talking about an EGA? Yeah, let's start from the top. Can you right. stand a bit closer? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's get started. We need an introduction, of course. So this is Evan Upton, the CEO of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, who's very gladly agreed to talk to us again this year. So we have a few questions prepared, which we would like to ask him. So the first one has to do with uh, the gap between microcontrollers and FPGAs. So of course, the um, PIO peripheral was designed, or when it was intended to sort of bridge the gap a little bit, but it is still uh, a simplified processor of sorts, even if it has a very simple instruction set, it still takes one cycle to execute each instruction. You cannot exactly do many things together, size set um, sort of helps you with that, but that's only GPIO stuff. So, do you have plans in the future to maybe make a Raspberry Pi FPGA product? But the most important thing as far as we are concerned is having a good tool chain because there are open source tool chains and then there's the proprietary ones yeah. which let's not, you know, have yeah. to talk about that. Yeah. So, so I think you're, you're quite right. I think it's very unlikely that we would uh, ship an FPGA. We've been shipping from Raspberry Pi products for 12 years. I guess we've never shipped an FPGA product. And generally, that's been because we haven't been able to solve that equation. Uh, come up with a good answer to the story about why we uh, about 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 two hundred years open, in particular about two hundred years open, about two hundred years rather than more a Raspberry Pi product. Yep. Now, um, I guess you could imagine us doing that. I mean, there are you know there are people mm -hmm. talking about the ice uh, uh, the ice devices. Yep. Um, uh, so you could imagine us maybe doing that. I don't think it's a high priority for us in terms of whether we would integrate FPGA into a uh, into a Raspberry Pi semiconductor product because that's an even harder challenge. <laughs> Don't just need yes. tools, you also actually need licensing like PGA fabric. Um, and there is a shortage of you are introducing an extra an extra constraint mm -hmm. between tools and licensing like fabric, and I'm not really aware of a uh, we can do that. Or we could build something ourselves. If you build something yourself, then you've got a couple of tools you get from scratch. Um, so I suspect it's not in our future. Um, uh, but you will see us doing it pushing the IO tools to try to maximize the amount of interface ports that we have that more process so the implication here is that there is still a little bit of room for improvement. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, you'll see that on our P2350. Uh, PIO 1.1, which we ship on 2350, does have additional uh, features and has features driven by the back, the, the, the positive back negative constraints. Mm -hmm. kind of, you know, we're using PIO 1.1 on, on the 2350. Probably the most notable um, uh, being the ability to index the fibers. Yep. Uh, just complain about a lack of general purpose registers. You can now use fiber space for general purpose registers. Yep. I, I was working on a problem. And I had a little bit of an interesting problem with uh, the FIFOs. So I had one PIO set up to read from an ETC continuously. So it just reads and then it sends to the FIFO, and once it's filled up, uh, it blocks and it stops reading. So you have another PIO instance that takes uh, reading from the thing and does something with it. But the problem is your reading is delayed by, well, four readings because of the FIFO. I was going to ask you if there was a way to bypass that, but that problem that no longer exists. And to be honest, I think it was a bit of a, well, a lack of knowledge on my part because you don't really have to set it up that way. Just a few weeks back, I got a system running with multiple state machines running different parts of one, well, one PIO program. It worked out fine, but there was this problem of not having enough instructions. If I could move one part to another PIO instance and somehow tell that, uh, or well, synchronize that with the first PIO instance, by an interrupt, maybe it would have been possible. Yeah. Now that problem is gone as well. Yes. And I don't remember asking you after your talk last year about exactly this. Will there ever be interrupts between PIO instances? Although it was a year ago, but I assume the chip design was probably mostly done it's by pretty the close. Yeah. Pretty close. So you probably knew the answer was a yes. Well, I I, I also you know I think you, you need to remember that mm -hmm. um, yeah I don't do all of this work. Of but this work is done by an enormous yeah. number of extremely talented people, and therefore I'm not always able to account for exactly. Well, I try to involve myself as much as I can because I, I genuinely see. find it super exciting. I'm mm -hmm. not always able to account for exactly the changes that are being made to the architecture. Yes. Of the it's probably almost always a very pleasant surprise when extra features. Are well, you know, we have we have, we have uh, they're super bright people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're super bright people who are you know, given a lot of latitude you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to to go solve problems. Who are excited about using. They're building a platform. This is probably one of the things you, know, that you have 
obviously there are technical things that distinguish um, the RPG series from like the Elder Scrolls and other um, platforms. Um, but the, I guess the organizational thing, the philosophical thing um, that distinguishes them is that generally people who are designing these just want to be to close them so they might offer them to like some enterprise and like close them openly. Uh, so now it's just going to have engineers, um, uh, hardware engineers, basic engineers designing chips for other people rather than designing chips for themselves. Um, and so many of those sort of um, uh, pain points, particularly around PIO, around uh, regulatory, around the MA controls, are um, pain points that are usually experienced by the engineering team who are then directly going to have to go and solve the problem themselves in the iteration. So it's a little inside in. So it's a really compelling way of doing uh, of doing basic engineering. And I think it actually has a sort of uh, philosophical Oh yes, I think we have somebody tell us recently that SDM doesn't exactly well uh, respond, so to speak, to hardware bugs even if they are proven. Well, this is Dimitri's so delightful blog post, which he is. Uh, he probably says things that maybe. I think that's what I read. It. Yes, indeed. In, uh -huh. uh, yeah, I believe this is a. Okay. Uh, I don't think that Dimitri. I don't think that. Uh, I don't think that either SD or Dimitri are on each other's uh, Christmas card list. <laughs> probably say that but I think there's a lot of there's multiple feedback loops even between between us and the corporation and within the corporation mm -hmm. itself so I guess we get a pretty polished product in the end because the people designing them have reused them yeah. and I'm impressed that we've got you know with a much more complicated product than RP2040 mm -hmm. that we've got to production with a relatively mild errata list it's not an it's not even going to be an empty errata list mm -hmm. but the errata list really is pretty short and pretty uh, inoffensive there's nothing, there's nothing, yeah. there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, speaking of offensive stuff, a friend of mine yeah. uh, did a few tests on uh, the ADC, the RP2040 versus the 2350. Ah, so if does, you he take like a, the, does he like the 2350? Yes, it's an improvement. Definitely. So the orange one is the 2040, yes, and you can see the INL is a bit uh, up and down. Yeah. The big curve was one of the third party boards, which for some reason is the ADC section hasn't been, or it was probably the reference hasn't been designed very well. This is the official RAS 25 uh, Pico 2 board, yeah. uh, dark blue line, and it's yeah. basically flat. It's good yeah. enough. It's yeah. definitely an improvement. It's, it's, a huge, it's a huge improvement. And you know, you know about the fixing this, right? You have, you have size, you have little size uh, capacitors mm -hmm. uh, inside the design, and um, there was a little uh, manual trim applied uh, to the size of a couple of those capacitor plates in order to adjust, to, to have the capacitor to be closer to a uh, power of two series. So each bit is like, I think we discussed well, this last time. Yeah, there was yeah. a bit of tweaking going yeah. on. Right, so the next question. Do you plan on adding small programmable logic elements to maybe a future Raspberry Pi microcontroller? So it's not just PIO, but actual, maybe a couple of AND gates, nothing like that. Uh, I think it's getting into FPGA. Yeah, territory. it's getting into FPGA territory, and I'm not sure that we, I'm not sure we have a good story. Let's say CPLP might have been out here. I see. Claim comments are quite mm -hmm. as well. As, as, yeah. as, as, as the previous yeah. question, um, the tool, you know, you need to, you know, you need to come up with a fabric, you need to come up with a tool for those that are uh, complex specialist error activities that we're not necessarily at all. Got it. And it is the same story with um, just digital or analog building blocks yeah, because right. SDM 32s and big yeah. microcontrollers have op amps in them. Yeah. yeah. Same story. Yeah, same story. Okay. Um, the you can buy a lot of op amps. Yes. You can buy a lot of external op amps. To of course. The difference, the difference in price between an RP uh, an RP twenty three fifty and an STM thirty two. Yeah. A lot of op oh yes, definitely. So next question. So, are there actual big industry players using your chips, like the RP twenty forty? Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's a one but answer. Yes. I guess you can't exactly yeah, tell right. more. So. Yeah, that answers that. But you know, we're selling many, many, many mm -hmm. hundreds. We're not yet selling millions of units a month um, of um, 2040 into industrial applications, but we're selling many, many, many hundreds of thousands of units. I, um, I suspect that this may be the year where we sell more um, silicon products than we sell more rubber products. Yeah, because the silicon products have a much lower unit cost, because mm -hmm. you look at our financials, you just look at them, you know, less than a percent of revenue. Um, but um, in terms of the impact on the world, I mean, I like to think that selling a chip in your pocket has the same sort of impact as the world. This represents Raspberry Pi's course to be transition from being purely a light on its product to being, mm -hmm. to being a blend of light on its product. I think it's a central level. Got it. 
So did the industry where well, lessons learned from that front influence the, the design of the thing to the to a certain extent? Yeah, I mean I think obviously the security thing yes. the security thing and the power consumption thing, um, particularly the either power consumption um, uh, topic and uh, the security thing is the most important thing. There are I mean I am not um, given the given how frequently other vendors microcontrollers have their security architecture, particularly the home protection architecture broken. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not um, uh, that much in, um, I, I don't really accept the idea that a lack of code protection is a barrier to, um, uh, to, to a industrial adoption. So I think anybody using one of these other devices has to be aware that um, somebody who's teaching remote code can concentrate on this that they don't really uh, catch in. Um, but it certainly is a case it doesn't help with the goes around with industrial markets. It doesn't help improve the, say, progressive the outside world without the code protection. Now, 2350, we do have code protection, so we have boot signing. Mm -hmm. We have code protection that doesn't have boot signing. Um, obviously, you know, we see other very competent basic engineering companies trying to do this and mess up. So, yeah, I think we probably have a feeling that maybe our system is broken too. You'll have seen probably that we're off to the ground too. Oh, yes. Um, we, uh, we, launch, we launch our product at DEF CON. We put our products on every DEF CON badge. We've offered a $10,000 badge. It's not a huge amount of money, but it is a sort of a token of our appreciation of something to say we can break the, uh, uh, the security and share it with us soon enough that we can do something about it. Um, nobody, where are we? We are uh, 10 days in. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody has submitted a great, um, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has submitted a break um, for 2350. So that's, a, that's incredible to have 2350 distributed. 2350 to 30,000 people at the best time. Definitely. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll address it when we can, but in the meantime, I think the fact that we are prepared to engage with protecting our uh, OEM customers' code is going to clearly qualify for uh, free industrial as well. So, next question. Um, will you ever end up making your own SOC, that is system on chip, and sell it standalone without the whole COVID? So, you mean for, for big ones? Yeah. Um, yeah, because it was small Raspberry Pi. We already, uh, we already sell Picos and we sell uh, RPK series of products. Big Raspberry Pi, I think it's important not to underestimate the challenges associated with building an SOC. The core SOC to a Raspberry Pi device has an RP1 IO controller on it, um, but the core, um, the core SOC, and that's a 40 nanometer device. The core SOC is a 16 nanometer device. Presumably, in order to do a future device, you need to go below 16. Really, the device going to 70 to 5 nanometers. I think it's really important. Delta in terms of difficulty between producing even pretty sophisticated 40 nanometer designs like RP1 and producing even fairly straightforward uh, designs, straightforward pure digital designs uh, on some of these fast pressure nodes. So I think, you know, I never say never, but I think it's extremely challenging. Mm. So, um, does the higher clock speed on the 2350? So I think it went from 133. Two hundred and fifty. Does it represent the same process that has been tested to a higher limit, or is it uh, some kind of improvement in hardware or the process that means we can get a little bit more um, overclockability out of it? So it's closed. So there should be the same amount of overclockability margin over one fifty. Mm -hmm. Put this thing out at one thirty three. Um, so one thirty three is. I'm going to humiliate myself with the thousand amounts now. I don't know how many. I don't know how many nanoseconds. How many nanoseconds? Uh, 100 megahertz is 10 nanoseconds, yeah. 133 uh, is slightly less than that. Yeah, yeah right, so it sort of feels like it's going to be uh, 7 and a half maybe. Um, so um, the um, uh, um, uh, 2350 is close to, um, uh, interestingly, it's close to 6.6, uh, 6.6 or 6.66. 6 uh, I think 6.6 nanoseconds. So you would expect it to be 150 megahertz to be closer to 6.6666. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's close to 6.6, .6, uh, which translates into a small um, uh, additional, so it's actually a function of close to about 151 and a half um, uh, megahertz. Yeah. Uh, and you would expect the same margin over 151 uh, that you probably have over 152. And indeed, when this was done in the wild, you would have that it's extremely overclocked and designed very overclocked. And it's 100 megahertz. Yep, on the topic of overclocking, the same friend also um, did a little bit of hacking. He fed a voltage into the um, the core voltage pin, mm -hmm. 
and he made a lot of the voltage versus the maximum overclock of the machine. Oh, that's cute. That's cute. What, Oops, did, you get, what did he get? Can we pitch that? Yep. Uh, he got up to a little bit above 500 megahertz yeah, yeah. and 1.6 volts. Wow. And it uh, probably it don't do that. Linearly, <laughs> yes. But it flattens off after a certain point. Yes. So, so I I'm guess not sure what makes it. I'm not sure what makes it that hot. Um, I mean, you are driving the process wildly out of spec. Okay. I would say you know, above 1. Point, I'm actually quite comfortable with that process. I'd actually about 1.4. So 1. In, in the wheel, we do ship. You know, we do ship. Two. So 1.2 is the, 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 the kind of do not receive process of not the normal process of the house. So in that range, again, you know, so when did he get to it? Uh, when did he get to 1.2? Uh, at 1.2, we got it up slightly, I think 375, yes. 375, I mean, that sounds, that sounds about right. And it's a measure, that's a measure of both, I guess, the difference between typical silicon, which I probably mm -hmm. is, and slow silicon, because of course, you know, we don't have an ABS solution. Um, so this is, you know, this is one multi so the difference between typical silicon and slow silicon, and then just the enormous amount of conservative information, you know, time and recipe um, that we did that we did uh, to provide all sorts of margin, margin for aging, margin for cost process. Of course. So I think uh, a margin for cost regulator yes. accuracy as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, is the other thing that's like you have to understand that the, re the optimal regulator that we have is not even remotely precise. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. we need to allocate some, you know, not too significant amount of. The fact that we could get the 2040 up to 400, I think, really raised our hope that the successor could go up to 1.5 I mean, 500, which we did achieve. But um, yeah, like you said, we don't know if it will be sustainable. Our 2040s have been running fine for well for so long. We've not had a problem. With 40 nanometers is an incredibly volatile process, but there's a, there is a huge difference between what I would do in the lab or in the lab and what we recommend in the industry. Definitely. It's more of an experimental thing. It yeah. hasn't failed so far, so far. Yeah. But we don't know what it might look like in five or six years' yeah. time. That's something that we have to test. Yeah. On the topic of overclockability, so there's been a major change. Um, the internal uh, regulator is no longer linear, but it's a switching regulator to the needs in uh, external parts. So there, there were a lot of interesting thoughts about the fact that the data sheet had like a couple of pages. It was one and a half, I think, devoted entirely to the inductor. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. specific instructions yeah. as to how it had to be oriented and yeah. the number of, I don't know, winding resistance and stuff, yeah. manufacturers. So it wasn't the most popular decision because for this sort of stuff, we or well, I and a couple of other friends do, switching regulators are bad. It's, they, they inject a lot of broadband noise into sensitive stuff. So you have a Pico over here on the board, there's a very sensitive node here. And you wonder why there's just spikes in an analog screen junction. Turns out it's coming from the regulator from the people. And indeed, we see some of our early access customers disabling mm -hmm. switching regulators. Yes. That really that's, yeah. that's absolutely right. I think it's, uh, we have to uh, come up with a compromise. So the linear regulator was adjustable, we could do it in software. Mm -hmm. But if we have an external re a linear regulator on the 2350, mm -hmm. It's a bit more difficult to adjust. It's not a simple matter. Of, I, I think I think at the point where you're prepared yeah. to throw away the amount of power associated with linear regulation, you're probably also prepared to over margin the uh, uh, the, uh, the amplitude of the regulator. So I would assume you would just you would just pick one point one. You would just pick one point one five and then have done the rest. I think we decided that one point two was a reasonable yeah, compromise. One point two is. I'm sure. It's one just the yeah. ease of the challenge of one point two is that it is mm -hmm. that you run a a risk of the, you know, if you have regulation. What I feel is that we are trading a little bit of flexibility for uh, overclockability. Yeah. So it's not as easy to well, just the whole thing is in software, but well, if you need a linear regulator compromise, it's not as easy as would be arbitrary. So the last question we have is if and when you will ever release a power over heater with hash for the five five. Uh, five, was it? We, yeah. will, we will release a power brief and I'd have for the 5.5. Five. Uh, it is occasionally you get a project which is um, uh, extremely long running. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
requires a little iteration. So I think it's a very, um, I think what we have here is a very thoroughbred design of what we can build. We've built a number of the other products, and I think they get better at building the POE products because it's interesting to build an adequate POE product. It's very hard to build a brilliant POE product. We have this in what's called the POE brilliant product. Um, uh, and so the architecture that we're using for the Cosmo Y5 POE does have these uh, POE cost cap costs. It's a, um, it's a product name known as Mother of Love. Um, it's um, uh, a thoroughbred architecture and is requiring a significant investment of engineering effort um, from people who are also on the large loaded and other aspects of our engineering work. Uh, we will get that. Um, I assume it will come back in the near future, but rather. Um, but again, uh, there's a it is a it is a downside of being us that we have to do it right. We don't get so it will happen, but when we do get it, yes. it will be a good one. It will be a good one. Yes. Um, it will be a good one. And I, I think we'll have, I think we already showed them, we showed an example in the, the Raspberry Pi 5 launch mode, in fact, when you see us looking at this one, we designed it inside the initial box. Um, and so it has this initial um, volumetric constraint, um, but it needs to be around the map. Iterate, uh, you're iterating on the product while also under a significant mechanical constraint like that is doubly challenging. But we'll get it because we got good because we got good engineers. Uh, we just don't always get there. That's one of the reasons why. Got it. Um, another off-topic question about the 2350. So you have to arm force and to risk iron force as well. That was a bit of a surprise. How did it? End up happening. Uh, something very early in the design stage. Yeah, I mean, people have asked us this. Why did you do it? Is it because we can? Yes, it's because we can. Um, I think it is a. It is somewhere where uh, look, we've been a member of Risk Five International for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've never been able to justify shipping Risk Five in the whole product line in the uh, in the, uh, in the big Raspberry Pi product line, simply because there's a lack of software maturity and there are restricted license rules that apply to the license for that particular course. You know, I can grant license course which allow me to build another Raspberry Pi three. So, uh, so it's never a bit, it's never a bit in the big product. Uh, in the small product, sort of similar concern to Clive really, that, that it's hard to you know, there are licensable call there are licensable calls in the M class, there are licensable calls, and there are um, freely available calls on GitHub. The concern with licensable calls is you have to license them. Yes. How if you go license them, you're going to go to you're going to go to right? mm. You know, I don't really need to go license them. Uh, 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 so it was unlikely. To Call. And then the concern with free calls is, of course, it might be integral. So there's also a concern that if you take a random call off GitHub, then uh, five years later someone comes to the office and says, I've got my call, and there's a stole it from me, you only wrote it. So this is, this is why you know, I bought you arms, I license you arms, right? I license you arms, and arms. I mean, GitHub is full of free arms, right? What, do I, what am I buying when I license you? Am I allowed to be buying arms? I'm buying the certainty that that really, that that really belongs to them, and they were allowed to license it. Um, what's happened? Five, of course, is that we then developed the Hassan 3 design in this kind of time. My apologies, very old friend of mine. Um, he developed it in public, so he developed it on GitHub in public. He talked about it as he did it on Twitter. Um, and so there is a, uh, in addition to being the person, the honorable person, um, there is, uh, there is uh, um, copious evidence for the design of life. And really, what we're doing here is we're taking the opportunity to get some exposure. System, which has the advantages and disadvantages compared to a licensed ISIL. So we're getting some exposure to the risk of ecosystem. Um, and we're, uh, to some extent, we're blessing, I suppose, Hazard 3. We're expressing our confidence in Hazard 3 as an IP clean architecture. Um, we think, you know, we're going to ship this product, no one's going to sue us because we know, uh, because we know where it came from. I think after a few years of shipping this architecture um, and us being conspicuous, you not getting into trouble for having done so. That's a useful service to the community. You know, not everything we do has to be about making money. Um, uh, it's a useful service to the community, and I'm, I'm glad we've done that. 
definitely. So it was an interesting experiment. And the fact that you made it uh, switchable between ARM and RISC V is even uh, more interesting. There was a great debate within the organization as to whether we should implement you know, that, that ability to do switching with all those present in the system. But there are other ways you could have productionized it. So what you could have done is you could have blown it. You could blow fuses to disable, blow IT, IGP fuses to disable the other process architecture. You could imagine a world in which you said, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll sell two SKUs and we'll blow those SKUs to one of the ATs and we'll, we'll have two, two products. You know, that'll, that'll be 2350 and that'll be, we thought, well, we'll call it like 2B50, uh, this time. Um, and, uh, and you pre blow the fuses and then you would have them decide whether to buy an ARM variant or a RISC V variant on the chip. Um, that felt like it was going to be a real pain uh, from a supply chain. So really, in fact, what we did is, is a supply chain management uh, uh, company. Uh, we're reducing, we're, we're avoiding the temptation to double the number of SKUs in our products as we double the entire supply chain for the burden associated with the final third of that decision to deliver. I think it was pretty interesting. I'm glad we did that. I, I, no, yes. I, I bled for it. I mean, I had sleepless nights over it, and I, I made, I think I made life difficult by vacillating about, mm -hmm. where, about which way we should go, um, but I think we, I think we got the right decision. Yeah. Definitely. I don't think it would have been as well received if it had had only this five yes. or only, well, ARM is not exactly a big problem yeah. if we had it, but the fact that you have two, I think, avoids a lot of problems. Yeah. Yeah. So is there a chance that you might release, depending on the reception of the 2350, but purely risk five using the, the necessary software support? I don't see the argument to do it. It's a lot of investment, billions mm -hmm. of dollars of investment to take a feature out of the chip. I, I, I don't think I would do that. It doesn't seem like a good idea. And to the point about software, we have made already made all those investments to ensure that you know, sorry from the point of view of our tool chain, if you use the video original studio code plugin um, for the Pico development, um, the ISO selection is just a general. Mm -hmm. So you effectively say, yes, I want, I want, I want this and this five plugin, this and our plugin, and we'll create some more. Uh, both the compiler, both tool chains, and we'll just switch between them. Similarly, so MicroPython, you go to David's website, you go to MicroPython.org, um, and you'll find that there are uh, both ARM and RISC-V versions of the uh, original MicroPython binary. Yeah, I think the VS Code extension was a big uh, lifesaver for people like it's me. Deal. It's, it's, yeah. it's a super big deal. I found it, for, I, I mean, I, I when I got the first version of it, having fought my way through the, the classic tool chain installation, <laughs> uh, when I got the first version of it, I was, I was like, oh, I'll just press a button and I've got wicked, I've got wicked lights. That is exactly uh, what some people yeah, want. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, it's a good um, yeah, single, press, single button press, uh, single compilation, good single button, button press debugging. Uh, yeah, that's what we've come to expect from the you know, PC. Um, of course. And um, I think it's what people should expect from their better, better debugging for them. Definitely. I think the VS Code extension also works in parallel with an existing installation of the um, SDK, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a good, it's, it's a great little product. It's a great little product, product. It's a little software product. It's a big so, um, do you plan to officially support it? The extension, of course. It is official. We do, we do officially support it. There was a question about that. I think it wasn't clear at the beginning, but it is officially supported. It is officially supported. So, it's officially supported and maintained. Um, Raspberry Pi yeah. product. We can expect to have it for as long as basically. So it's our story for it is our story for non command line free development. Now, exactly what, what, what you will see at the moment is you'll, you'll see better interoperability of our tool chain and our um, our products with some non free tools. So mm -hmm. INR and um, uh, Kyle, uh, Kyle Webster. You'll see some better, yes, we've been making the CMSYS investments required to interoperate them with ARM's uh, professional tooling, their proprietary professional tooling, mm -hmm. um, and we've been making some of the investments in um, uh, compiler and assembler agnosticism required to interoperate with Metal Gear, IAR universe, which is the mythic um, from, uh, from the pieces of your plan, um, uh, universe is the reason we started out there. Yeah. Assembler yeah. syntax in particular, little yeah. things, assembler yeah. Not so. exactly my Assembler macros is the same thing, but uh, um, yeah, we're, we're getting there. Yep. So, another off topic question what's up with the AI hack? It uh, was a bit left field as far as we were concerned. Yeah, we like to try different things, right? I mean, what are you measuring? You're measuring our, our desire to do different things. 
So um, yeah, we have a great relationship with Halo, with Silicon Commander. Uh, you know, it's great Silicon, we are supporting by great software. The opportunity, obviously, because they package that in an M2 form factor, mm -hmm. we have the M2 hat product appear yeah. in, in May. There is an obvious opportunity to, to put those together um, to build a piece of product. Um, something we built a few thousand of, and they sold just like that. We built a few thousand more, and they sold like that. So it's, I think what we've tapped into is a later demand, a market power, mostly our enthusiast customers, I think, at the moment. Uh, but I believe that will spread into our industrial customer base, a latent demand for some exposure to modern AI uh, technology in the world in my world. There was a general consensus, given the fact that you're now a publicly traded company, that you're pandering to the trends of AI, but we weren't a publicly traded company at the time. It was a week before the IPO. <laughs> and, oh, well. and, and it was it was something where yeah, you know, I, I I at the time thought you know is this wow this looks a bit this looks a little, a little bit like it's IPO related. But it genuinely, uh, you know, as God is my witness, uh, it genuinely was that was the point at which I thought. Yeah. Nice, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, we have something that we'd like to show you. It was designed by my friend Nico. He's currently behind the camera. Uh, where is it? I hope it didn't break. It's this uh, breakout for the, the dev board right here. Oh, cute. That's fun. It's called the Pro Pico. Mm -hmm. There's a few um, quality of life changes. Oh, the, the baseboard itself is a completely different thing. Yeah. Uh, so it has a USB C connector, it has an LDO, and uh, because the 2048 doesn't exactly have an easy way of permanently storing stuff, you need um, EPRO without. Mm -hmm. That's fun. That's really cute. Is that going to be on the market? Is that going to be available? <laughs> Hacker they went crazy over it. They, they want it, but I didn't do anything yet. You're not going to do anything with it. You should do something with it. It's so, it's so, I love it when people do kind of Pico like, Pico like form packets of our products. It's, you know, it's the great thing about being a semiconductor vendor is that you know we are it's, we, we love it when this happens. You know, mm. We don't need to make our money from books. You know, if people, even if people, and you see this on AliExpress, even if people just clone Pico. Just like copying. I don't care <laughs> because they're still buying off of it. So this is this is this is the lovely thing, and it means that we can we can the you know, Raspberry Pi because of our focus on um, uh, as, as making large numbers of products in order to drive the unit cost down. It means we can't explore the full space of mm. potential uh, sort of price performance or the full configuration space. So we have to pick some bits of the configuration space that we think are um, going to be popular, um, and then. Put all our investment in there, and that means we miss bits of adjacent configuration space, um, and, and that's been that's been the, you know, the lovely thing of discovering that some people will pay if we're charging four pounds for a pico, some people will pay ten pounds in order to get a chop down pico that's half the rent. They <laughs> pay over twice the amount of money for a smaller and nominally less functional product because they have a space constraint. Um, that's not something that we would ever. That's not a bit of uh, brown space that we would ever be able to explore ourselves. Um, I'm not sure if I asked you about this last year, but how did the Pico end up with a micro USB instead of something a bit more? Well, what you'll notice from that design is that you can't fit the mounting holes. There are no yes. mounting holes there, right? And so yeah. you, you would have had to either sacrifice the mounting holes at that end of the board, or you would have had to um, lay the board wide. So it's not it's not costless. I mean, the micro so USB is a smaller uh, connector than, than USB C, and it lets you do different things. So it's a mechanical. It's a me mechanical compromise. It is also a cost compromise. Um, yeah. uh, you know, micro oh, USB, yes. a quality micro USB connector is significantly cheaper than a quality USB C connector. That's just true. I'm, I'm sad. I'm sad for everyone who's a big fan of USB C, <laughs> but yeah. that is just the reality. That's just reality. Um, and I, I apologise for that. I apologise for objective reality I think and not being disappointed. One of the so. biggest things people complain about the Pico is the fact that it doesn't have a USB C. And they should ab absolutely go buy a clone that, that has <laughs> USB C and a mounting hole. Uh, you yeah, know, that's fine. Um, yeah, this, is, this isn't a, as I say, I am intensely relaxed mm -hmm. about people consuming RP2 series microcontrollers in other people's desktops. That's really good. So it's a basic ingredient that people can consume in all Yes. They just put it in whatever dish they want. And yeah, I don't care. Right? Your chip, I mean, they yeah. use it. Yeah, you know, um, we have, our, we have our particular, we have our particular view that compactness and mounting holes and cost structure were things that we cared about a lot. That's absolutely not to say that that sort of constraint applies to our customers or applies to our potential opportunities. Got it. And I think we did mention in passing yesterday about uh, the fact that the 2350 is still USB 1.1. Everyone was expecting a little bit of an upgrade. 
So if you put an upgrade in that, that would be yes to do. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think um, you know, USB two comes with a, an area penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes with a system complexity penalty. Um, uh, yes, it's a feature which I, you know, I can absolutely understand people wanting to put the platform. Um, but um, I think that for our purposes, USB one is actually quite a good. It's quite a good fit. Um, you know, think about what we see USB being for in platform. So yeah, one by one is good. Um, yeah, is it likely that uh, we, we would, will address that in the future? Design, yes, it's a time that it's important. Uh, mm -hmm. that we the we would probably, I would imagine that something to the end of the USB one era may not like to build products, but we're talking about yeah, uh, hypothetical products that don't exist yet and are so many, many years away. Definitely, then there's um, definitely ready-made chips. I think what was it called again? The Infineon. The easy USB. Yeah, you can talk to that using PIO and push data through it. Yeah. That is and again, thing. this is another little bit like the example of the op amps. Mm -hmm. You know, if you build a sufficiently low cost compute venue, you still have enough money and you still have a compact and low cost compute venue. You still have enough money and there's really no order. The price point is pretty incredible as well. The 2350 was not that much more expensive than the 2040. So it's, so 10 cents, so it's 10 cents more. Yeah. It's, it's 10 cents more at every price. Point. So it's 80 cents at 3400. Um, uh, 90 cents at uh, 500 off for the flashless design. Flash costs you 20 cents. The big package costs you 10 cents. And therefore, you know, a one off your products cost 110, 120, 130, 140 more. Um, yeah. Little package, no flash. Big package, no flash, little package, no flash, big package, big package, no flash. It's quite a nice, you know, for somebody, it's, it's nice to have that pen and trace. It's nice to have that big yeah, it's true. Feels like Feels like power for two nothing out of this. <laughs> it's, just, it's just cheap. There's nothing yeah, else to say. It that's it. It's a low-cost product. It's designed to be structurally, it's designed to have a, a robust structure. It's not a product that you can make cheap. It's a product that you can make cheap. It's a low-cost structure. And then we pass the majority of the benefits of that low-cost structure. Some SDM32 microcontrollers. I mean, it's shocking how expensive. <laughs> it's shocking how expensive you said it. some, some microcontrollers. I, 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 you look at them and you, you struggle to understand what the. You could struggle to understand what the the rationale is for the price, and you struggle to understand Anymore. sometimes how how those products have. Given it's a competitive market, you know, there's nobody has a monopoly on the microcontrollers. Um, the cost structure of incumbent microcontrollers is baffling to me sometimes uh, because you thought that they would be competed at the various vendors would compete with each other down to a much more reasonable cost structure. Um, so you know, one thing I have, you know, one, an aspiration I have for this, you know, is hopefully we can reach that people's expectation by bringing dual core products up to the extreme to substantially below a dollar. You know, there is a hope that what we do is uh, you know, we can reset people's expectations about what the microcontroller is going to cost. Definitely, I think one of, if not the major um, points that appeal to us is that it's so cheap. Yeah. And for not that much, you can integrate it into a custom board, like, like a Pro Pico, for example. And it, 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 it's yeah. low cost and it's and, it, and it's transparent cost. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, I'm telling you, cost, that's the point. There is no, you want to buy a million chips from me, like, that's what I'll charge you. Yeah. You know, it is, yeah. you know, it is completely transparent. No special deals, mm -hmm. completely transparent pricing. Right? Yeah. Um, that's and, cool. and that's, I think that's really important that people have the confidence to know that, that, that you know, nobody else is, you know, it's not just you're getting a good deal, it's that nobody else is getting a better deal. So, um, 2040 came out in 2021, was it? Are yeah. you seriously going to ask me about the next microcontroller a week after we launched 2350? <laughs> Apologies, but uh, okay, uh, um, I think we have all, in a way, been waiting for the next Raspberry Pi microcontroller since the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. I've had a few friends who have been talking about it every few weeks, like, when are they releasing the next thing, when are they releasing the next thing? And here we are, we got the next thing, but what about the next one? <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, there, there will probably be one. So what does the future look like? Um, I I think we're just too close to the current design um, to, to, right, to, to, to think about it. I mean, look, you can think about the obvious places you can go. You can yeah. go up, down, or sideways, right? You know, you can go yeah. up, in performance, up in price performance, you can go down in price performance. 
or you can go, when I say sideways, you could think about adding other features into mm -hmm. the product which are not um, performance features, which are capability features. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you can think about um, So, um, uh, probably, uh, those are probably in, I would say, up in price performance is easier than down in price performance. Mm -hmm. It's hard to go down, significantly down from RC2040, uh, largely because you encounter die area. A, you encounter die area in that if you then produce the total cost structure from the design, you really have to commit to flash on die, mm -hmm. uh, which then forces you to a flash capable, uh, to a flash capable process, uh, which is then a, a, a new set of features. Or, or it forces you to go investigate the yeah, MRAM or RRAM or one of the other um, uh, sort of non-flash, uh, non yeah. non-memory uh, yeah. technologies. Um, so there are some substantial challenges associated with going down. Going up, of course, is, is, is a case of Adding more powerful processors. There are some challenges in that the M class roadmap doesn't obviously have a, um, a, an M33 but better design. Yeah. Really. Once you get into the M55 or M85 class, um, at those fundamentally they have a different feeling in terms of the magnetic of the M class. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they have a different feeling in terms of how you integrate that into the system. They have a different level of pipelining, which is kind of incompatible with our general philosophy that we want you to be able to access memory south of the uh, cost bar uh, in a single <coughs> So, so there, pro there probably isn't a direct um, performance up available to you, um, uh, but uh, you know, never say never. Um, you know, uh, we, 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 we try never to do things once because it messes up the spreadsheets. Um, so um, you know, we, we certainly are going to continue to develop the sort of thing for Raspberry Pi, uh, which is going to decide what that next is. We'll see you in two years' time. I think I'll give you a little Come bit back of in two years' time. Go. Come back in two years' time. Come back in four years. Four years. But I will be here every year, so you can continue to ask me that question until the answer is look at the thing. Yeah, yeah. we'll be back to border. <laughs> 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 is there anything else? Uh, you can like I mean, you're out of the frame, that's the only part, but oh, other than well, that. Uh, I'm not the main attraction. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, anything else off the record, maybe? No. Wonderful. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.